Today I've titled the message, Prayer Zeroed In on God. Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 19. You know, there was a story of a little monkey, and the monkey was so cold, his hands were freezing, and he, he had sat at the window of a, on the sill of a house, and he came into this old abandoned house, and he, and he, he went up to the fire, and uh, he tried to warm his hands, but the little monkey froze to death because it was only a picture of a fire. You know... I think one of the problems in the American church is that we want the feelings of emotion in prayer. We want an experience, but it's not real. We can conjure up sob stories and events that woo crowds and grab our attention and make us feel really moved. But have we really communed with God? And today, I kind of, I'm afraid to say there was one pastor who was asked, uh, or he was talking about his church, he said, I'm sure our church will go first in the rapture. Why do you say that? Because the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Ouch. Well, I hope that is not our epitaph. That we would be ones that would not be dead, but we would be alive to Christ. If you're not in the book of Daniel, please turn there. Daniel chapter 9. Is God um, enamored with cliches and with routine or even emotionless prayer? Today I want to ask this question. What kind of prayer pleases God? I am, I'm not appealing for some spoofy or religious gimmick. I, I don't know. I haven't seen them in a few years, but I used for a little while. I got these prayer carpets that came in the mail, and and, and if you just touch this thing or pray on this and send so much money back into the guy that gave it to you, I mean, because somebody, some celebrity in Christianity prayed over this carpet and and if you send a handkerchief in or this that or another thing or chain letters chain emails forwarded etc and all those kind of gimmicks over the years too often people want emotions and passions so instead of being real with god they fake it and today I want us to look in your Bible. Let's look at Daniel's prayer. Let's look at real prayer. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3 through 19. Then I sat, set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel who those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which we, he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him and he <clears throat> has confirmed his word with which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing up us in great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem 
verse 13. As it is written, the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it up upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does. Though we have not obeyed his voice, and now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins... And for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your name's own sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Lord God, would you please bless the studying of your word. Help us to be good students of it. Help us to understand line upon line and help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives. Help us to be found faithful. And Lord, help us to have prayer that's zeroed in on you. Lord, help us, Lord, to have prayer lives that are about you and about your honor your reputation and not our own. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we look in our passage, I have a, my main proposition for you is God desires our prayers to be engaged with Him. Uh, to be engaged with Him. That is where we want <clears throat> our focus to be. Our desires, God desires our prayers to be engaged with Him. You know, there is the question, how do you and I engage God in prayer? You know, our prayers reveal what you and I are interested most in. If you're praying for just selfish ends, for things, for conveniences, for even less pain, which God says, ask, seek, and knock. There's things that we can ask. But do you ask for more than just yourself? How do you commune with God? How do you interact with Him? You know, we can and should be captivated by our God when we pray. And today, our first point is this. A yearning to express as engaged prayer warriors, we should be consumed with, number one, a yearning to express worship to God. We want to be ones that say, God, you are worthy of all of our attention. In verse 4, he comes, he says, I set my face toward the Lord, toward Adonai, my God, to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He, here he sets his face toward the Lord. He's like, God, I want to focus on you. You know, <clears throat> one of the things I really appreciated, uh, I just came across another book by D. Edmund Heber, excellent Greek scholar of a, a former generation taught at Bob Jones, but um, he mentioned this. Um, I really appreciated the, how he brought up David, or not David's, um, trying to think, Daniel's routine, his earnest persistence. In verse 3, he set his face unto the Lord. Back in chapter 6, verse 11, he continued praying and making supplication before his God. In chapter 10, he continued his disciplined quest for three whole weeks until the divine answers arrived. He was known for persistence in prayer. When God says, keep knocking, do you keep knocking? Do you keep coming to him in prayer? 
one of the things we love about David is he's, or not David, Daniel, is he's so faithful. He's so persistent in coming before the Lord and not giving up. You know, King David, and yes, I mean David, in Psalm 55, 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud. You see, one of the things that we see with both David and Daniel is that they had systematic prayer. They came to God. If you don't have a place and a time to pray, it's not going to happen. Those who do not make a systematic way of praying don't pray like they need to. I'll never forget J.R. years ago. He started praying. One of the best things for his spiritual walk is living in past Mobile and the whole drive, he prayed. And he just prayed through the whole church and prayed through friends and family and co-workers and different ones. And do you create a daily routine to meet with God. That's something that we need to be able to have a vibrant communion with God in prayer. Um, I appreciate this, D. Edmund here. Those who have no regular habits of prayer very seldom do much praying. You know, when, and as long as that becomes the habit of life, we're not ready, as Hebrews 4.16 says, to find grace to help in a time of need. Um, because you even think of what Jesus said uh, when he was teaching how to pray in Matthew 6, which we're going to go to in just a moment. When you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father. Jesus often went to a certain place to pray. Jesus taught us, hey, make sure you go to your closet and pray to your Father. Now, you're like, the closet's kind of a weird place, Pastor. It don't get stuck on the place. Make a place to pray. For me, I do like praying on my knees when I'm at home because I'm undistracted. At my office here, I like praying at my desk with a list of names in front of me because I can stay focused. You learn how can you pray systematically, consistently, devoutly, and meaningfully with the Lord. Hold your place here. Turn over to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And I realize our first John series, um, we just went over this um, in the previous message on this from Matthew 5, uh, 14 uh, through 16. But I would like us to just a reminder again. As we look into this, we see in Matthew 6, 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, you know what this is here? It is an imperative. God, you are holy. God, you're to be treated as holy. Um, here he's coming. He's like, God, you're transcendent. Uh, you're above us. You're greater than us. You're separate from us. And Lord, we're acknowledging that. You know, we need to be concerned and occupied, first of all, with a person. Hallowed be your name, God. When we enter in prayer, it ne there needs to be worship. One of the saddest things to me is I, I see young Christians, I see old Christians that aren't walking with God like they should, and they've never made it a habit of worshiping God. Adore Him. Thank Him. You know, through the Christmas season, we, we see the signs, Oh, come let us adore Him. But no one hardly does it. No one knows what it means. Do you come and adore your God in prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We come from God. This is who you are. Your name. You're to be reverenced. You're to be revered. God, you're an authority and I willfully submit to you. Verse 13. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Um, Matthew 6, as you know, starts and ends with worship. God, yours is the glory. You're holy at the beginning. And at the end, yours is the, the glory, the power, the glory forever. Yours is the kingdom. God, it's all about you. You know what's missing in our prayer life is often God. Ouch. That's, and if God's missing in our prayer life, in reality, who are you praying to? 
Is it your idealism? That's a dangerous place to be. Well, I know this is a, a bit of an illustration, that, but I want us to go back to, go back to Daniel where we will stay. Um, let us aim to let the character of God steer and shape our prayers. Does Daniel say, hey God, you know, isn't it about time that you released us from captivity? You know, it's been about nearly 70 years, God. Uh, time's about up. Or does God, did Daniel come to God and say, you know, I've been reading in Jeremiah and I, I'm excited about uh, the time that I get out of this place. Is that what you hear Daniel saying? Does Daniel say, hey, finally, all of my faithfulness, my faithfulness is paid off. Do you hear that attitude coming through Daniel's prayer? Not at all. Verse 7. We see that Daniel makes his appeal in prayer on the basis of what? God's righteousness. Look in verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Verse 14. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Verse 16. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray. Do you know why it's important for us to say, God, you are a righteous God when you pray? It's important because there is not a hint of wrong in you, God. You and I get so Eeyore-ish in the circumstances of life. Our world is falling apart at all times. And we get so myopic and we start looking at our circumstances and we get caught up in the drama. And if you start reading your drama and reading life through drama, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to think, man, I got the short end of the stick. But if you worship God, God, you are righteous in all your ways. God, there's not a hint of wrong in you. God, you're good. God, you're holy. Do you know what's going to shape your, your attitude? It's going to say, God, life's about you and it's not about my circumstances. And I just lift this up before you. God, I'm not going to give you a bad review. You know what the problem is? We're used to giving everybody a three, four, five star review. You don't give God bad reviews and expect to have meaningful prayer life. You need to be coming before God and say, God, I want to give you all the stars of heaven because you're, you're good, you're right, and you're holy. Daniel comes before God. God, you're just in all your dealings. How should the righteousness of God shape your prayer? You're saying, God, I affirm and worship you as just. God, I'm not going to accuse you of injustice. I know I've brought this up before. One of the horrible heresies of our modern psychologized age is that you need to forgive God. God has never sinned. In Him there is no sin, which means He has never wronged you, O oh selfish one. You should never Ever, if you've ever thought, I need to ask God, I need to forgive God, you need to repent of that as sin because it's, it's flat-out heresy. And so we need to be careful that there is no blame in God for Israel's sin. Who committed Israel's sins? Who went after idols? Who forsook their God and chased after all kinds of wicked living? And the mountains of Israel were full of idols and groves and all kinds of things of that nature. Half of their kings were ungodly. Northern Israel, not one of them was saved. That's bad news. Who committed those sins? Did God do that? Let's think, did God tell them to go chase after foreign and ungodly women and all these other things? No, he didn't tell them to do that. Oh, God forbid doing those things. God taught them the way that was good, and they chose not to sin. Well, as I think about this, when you and I are tempted to say, Lord, how could you allow this to happen? You and I incredulously whine before God and say, God, why can't things be different for me? And we stomp our foot and with a bad attitude. God, this is not fair, we whine. The problem with fairness is I deserve something, I think. I become more and more entitled. Notice how Daniel appeals. 
Look in verse 4. This is beautiful and it's worth marking in your Bible. And I prayed to the Lord my God, made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy. Do you notice what two basis is he comes to God? God, you're the covenant keeping God. God, you're faithful. I hope a great song in your heart often is great as thy faithfulness. Here, here David comes and he says, God, you are faithful. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your, you are the covenant keeping God. And two, you're the God of mercy. Now, if you have NASB or ESV, you might have another rendering. You might have steadfast love or loyal love of God. This is our Hebrew word chesed. And here, Daniel comes before God and he's like, God, you are the loyal God. You're the loyal, loving God. God, you're the one who's steadfast in love. Here, Daniel hangs his hat, if you would, on the love of God and it shapes his prayer. You know, whatever we learn in 1 John, that we might enter before him with confidence, right? Boldness. Freedom of speech. God's like, I want my children to have great confidence in prayer. And we saw that in 1 John 4, uh, 5, 14 through 16. Verse 4, we see the chesed, the steadfast, loyal love of God. But in the King James, New King James, you have the word mercy again in verse 9 and 18. But it's a different Hebrew word. It's not the same word as chesed. It's a different word. Let's look at verse 9. In verse 9, and to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. The word mercy there is rachem, R-E-H, and a little hack mark underneath it, E-M. It's the compassions of God. This is the word that's used of a superior to an inferior, often used of a, of a mother caring for a baby or for an infant. How, how, did, how do you care for an infant? You, you hold that infant carefully. You attend to it. You show pity to the, the baby because the baby is incapable of so much. And yet you come with compassion. And our word here it, uh, that we have mercy, um, that the concept of compassion or pity is very much the idea of this word mercy in verse 9. Now, um, it's the nurturing, protective, loving care of God. God, I come before you as one who has a compassionate, caring love for me. Does that build your confidence in the Lord? When you're thinking about how good your God is, Satan wants to cast out. He's a slanderer. If you do not worship God, Satan, the slander of your faith, will undercut your trust in God. I told you before, my hobby horse, why we do the call to worships, is that you would, every single week, that we would build upon the trustworthiness of your God. That's why you need to be in the Psalms every week, worshiping God. You need to read your Bible looking for things to thank God for. If you don't enter your Bible reading looking for something to thank God for, love Him back for, worship Him about, your devotions are half rate at best. You need to love your God more. That is the purpose of you having those times with God in your daily meeting with Him. As we see in verse 18, the same word, Rechem, come up. Verse 18, it says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear and open your ear, eyes and see our desolations. And the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Again, the same word. And that word I mentioned, it's also used in the, of the womb. It's the Hebrew language of the womb. It's used of that protective care. It's sometimes translated, um, at, at least in the Old King James, as bowels. Um, compassion, mercy, sympathy, tenderness. It can be translated elsewhere, but bowels and pity are also the concepts behind that word. You know what Daniel doesn't do from verse 19? He doesn't come around strutting his stuff like he's really something big. God, you got, I mean, hey, who wouldn't love old Daniel here? Does he come before God like that? No. 
Here, he comes before God. He's like, God, I, I have nothing to brag about. This is about you, God. And we need to be ones that come before God as good. You know, aren't you glad that God is both righteous and compassionate? And that you and I can trust him. He's both just and the justifier of your soul. God saves. He richly saves. He's merciful. We never want to come before God and say, Hey, God, give me what I deserve. What's coming to me? Daniel doesn't do that. That's why he's, so, he's such a real individual. Do you come before God on the basis of, his, basis of his mercy, his compassion? Well, Dr. John III said this, God, I serve you. This is an illustration. God, I... I put you, I put my two quarters of Christian service into the big candy machine of your blessing and you owe me about now. Isn't that the attitude that we have a lot of times? God, I literally hear this often, Taryn, I do. But I've been doing everything right. Why has life been so hard? Hey, in this world you're going to have trials. That's the promise you need to learn. And we need to learn that they are not bad things. Let the character of God steer your prayer. Look in verse 7 and 8. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Okay. Do you see the word but? I, when I have words of contrast in my Bible, sometimes I will uh, do some kind of mark around it. Um, here I have a little square around the word but. But to us is shame of face. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel, and those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Here he comes before guys like, God, you're so righteous, but God, let me not mistake it. I'm not, Lord. I, I am not. I, haven't, I don't have any bragging rights before you but you're to be boasted about God. You're completely right. There's no injustice in you. And verse 8, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. You know, I have, I have learned some things as a counselor years ago that uh, sometimes I'll be talking about people and, and uh, I want to find out how their relationships. I'm like, do you pray for so and so? Do you pray for your mom and dad? Or, yeah, I pray. I'm like, how do you pray for your mom and dad? God, would you help them to stop drinking and just start being nice? Now, that prayer could be said two ways. It could be it could be selfishly motivated, or it could be genuinely motivated for his good. But a lot of times I start to hear people's selfishness come out in what they pray if they pray. And so we need to be ones. You know, the old tea bag illustration. I have uh, two bags in this here cup. Uh, constant comment and royal raspberry. So that's the flavor. What comes out of this water that I have? The effect of that tea. I have raspberry spiced tea, if you would. And... Uh, that, uh, what's in the bag comes out. Christian, the more you worship the Lord, the more you confess your sin, the more the right things can come out of your life. And, but, the more we live in sin, the more self-absorbed we become, the more that will be the flavor of your prayers. Look in, uh, as you go there, we want to be ones that, that can handle Actually, that's not quite the word I want. Um, you know, if sin affects other areas of your life, how will it not affect your prayers? And so we just need to keep that in mind. When we choose to sin, <clears throat> and just a second, I got shuffled here. Okay. When, when we choose to sin, um, we, our prayer, prayers are definitely impacted by that. Um, we are lying to ourselves if we think that we can isolate the influence of our sins. A second point for us to consider today is to be engaged prayer warriors. We should be consumed with, number two, an honest evaluation about our sin. 
Look in verse 5 and 6. Verse 5. But we have sinned. Okay, I am actually going to draw these words out here in just a moment. So, um, first, sin is missing the mark. That is verse 5. We have sinned. The word sinned here is to miss the mark, to wander away from. And here, God's like, you have wandered. Daniel's like, I've wandered away. Our people have wandered away, God. Does that put an ache in your heart when you see people sin? Do you, does it put an ache in your heart that you're capable of the sins and that you sin too? Here, David, you hear him saying, God, we have wandered away. We've missed the right goal. We've gone for the wrong uh, goals, if you would. Next, and committed iniquity. That is our next phrase in verse 5. Um, he basically is saying, God, I've acted perversely. I've distorted what was right. I distorted it with wanting evil things. I've committed iniquity. Um, next, we have done wickedly. That is, uh, this is premeditated to know what's wrong. We've, we have objectively gone after premeditated evil. I made the choice, God. Here Daniel is, one of the most righteous men of the Old Testament. And he says, God... I was involved. We were involved. We were engaged in thinking in the wrong things. I can imagine Daniel at this point is thinking back to when he was probably 13, 14, 12 years old, 10 years old, back in Jerusalem and seeing all the evil in Sin City, Jerusalem. Isn't that horrible to say Sin City, Jerusalem? I, I thought it. I didn't think it was a Las Vegas. Well, by the end, more and more evil had spiraled down in wickedness. And Daniel, nearly 70 years later, is like, God, we were guilty of sin. God, I was a boy there. I lived that, God. I, my heart wandered at times. I saw those idols. I saw the things that people said they promised. You could just imagine Daniel's mind going back to a boy when he's like, man, the world was big in my hometown that was supposed to be the place of worship for you, our God. Now, this is all a little bit of imaginative here. I'm just trying to think. As he vividly prays, God, I missed the mark. I chose perverted and wicked things. We as a nation went off the, the, uh, the tracks here. We have done wickedly. And then verse 4, or, I mean verse 5, and the fourth point here is we rebelled. That is to defy authority. God, we defied you. And then I want to add another one that was not on this list as I was studying today. From verse 7, New King James has, we've committed unfaithfulness, basically. Um, look over in verse 7 toward the end of the verse. Because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Unfaithfulness. You could translate that treachery. Uh, the, the concept here is an idea of disloyalty, unfaithfulness. Um, here, God, you're the covenant-keeping God, and we're the covenant-breakers. That's, God, we didn't keep our promise. Can I tell you, when does a liar stop being a liar? It's not when he starts telling the truth. It's when he remembers that we're members one of another. Isn't that what Ephesians 4 tells us? Christian, you're not going to be other-minded about the Lord. You're not going to care about your unfaithfulness until you learn that this really is about the Lord. Until you remember, we're members when I'm not, I need to love others around me and I need to love my God. That's when you keep the promises. You're not deceitful. You're not two-faced. You're genuine to the truth. Why? Because you're like, it really matters that I love the other person. Until you love, you don't stop lying. You don't stop breaking your word. You've got to love others more than yourself. You've got to love God in such a way that treasures Him. God, we've done this great treachery. Um, this is both His sin and the sin of the nation. This is deplorable filth. It's disgusting. You know what? What does our world do? Our television, our, uh, our smartphones, everything else, they advertise sin as cute. Yeah, uh, earlier today, um, a few of us were talking about cartoons, and there was, uh, and you, you go back and you're like, ah, that cartoon had some really bad, suggestive kind of garbage in it. 
or the music was just like really trying to get your mind to go in a very bad direction. Um, and if I were to say the, just a phrase of that song, you would all start being able, you would have that evil replay of something that you know. You know, Christians really shouldn't be singing, saying that. And yet it was made in a cute little cartoon. How much of the time does the world sell sin as cute? And we need to be careful. Too often we pray, God, I slipped up, I goofed. We soften the offense and the nature of our sin. We need to remember that in, I want to hold your, we know that Jeremiah 79 says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, but you want to write down Hebrews 3 just as a reminder to yourself uh, about sin. But in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is tricky business. And you and I are easily deceived, easily hardened, daily hardened. And the book of Hebrews, one of the themes that comes up throughout it is beware of drifting. It's so easy to look at the pleasures of sin, the fleeting pleasures of sin, and get caught up in those. Our hearts are deceived. We're blinded by our affection for sin. You know, when we choose to sin, at that moment, I am wanting more than God. I'm wanting sin. I'm saying God is not enough in that moment. We cloud our judgment further because we justify ourselves. We elevate our desires over God and others. Today I want to look at this. <clears throat> um, number three, as engaged prayer warriors, we should be consumed with, three, a jealous love for God's reputation and glory. Look at the really rich beauty of this. Look in verse 15. In verse 15, as he comes here, um, I'm going to read that verse 15. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned. And he comes here, he's like, but God, you brought us out of Egypt for your name's sake. Do you remember Moses pleading, God, for your namesake and glory, would you spare us that your name would be honored for your reputation's sake? You and I need to be thinking more about God's reputation than our own. You know, one of the sad things that we live in a day and age, not a day and age, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. But you know one of the, the fear of man, how much of the time does conservative Christianity do things according to what we look like before other people? There's a temptation to make sure that we appear like we have our act together, that we use the code words for a good, nice little Christian. Meanwhile, it's phony. God's like, I, do you remember what God told with David? God's not desired sacrifice more than these things. He's like, I, I want obedience. I want a genuine heart for me, basically. Remember when David's about to die and he challenges his son Solomon? He's like, I want you to have a single heart for God. I want you to be single-hearted, basically. And uh, we need to be ones that are saying, God, please help me to not have a divided heart. God, this is for your name and your glory. Lord, if I live for me, I won't live for you. Because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You will love the one. And what is he going to do with that? He's going to hate the other. We need to be careful because here, Lord, you brought us out for your name's sake. Verse 15. Verse 16. O oh Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray. Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of uh, our sins and for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people, and as are a reproach to those around us. Can I pause for a second? Verse 16 and 17. What's the key word? Your. 
Did you see it? Your righteousness, your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, your people, your face, your sanctuary, your name. Do you know what he's doing? He's like, God, this is all yours. Lord, for, for you, Lord, for you. I want to have a question for you. Do you list off the things in your life? Lord, this is your house. I've been trying to put it back together, but it's yours. And if it's not your will for me to get it all together right now, it's yours. Do you submit to God your vehicle? Lord, the wires aren't quite putting together right now the way they're supposed to. It's shorted out. Lord, it's your truck. It's your wires. And Lord, help me be a good steward. But it's yours. Do you hold on to things loosely? I'll never forget my dad telling me how he worked hard. He sold firewood. He split wood. He worked, I mean, probably 80 hours a week. He was gun-ho in his 20s. He was logging on state land, buying logs off the states, reselling them. He worked non-stop all the time. He saved that money, bought himself a bulldozer, then used that bulldozer, made tons of money, uh, tons of money. He made some money and so he could buy a farm because that's what his heart was set on. He did everything to make that farm like prim and proper. And then my mom died. All of a sudden that tractor accident turned his life around. He's like, you know what, I was living for all the right things. I wanted everything whitewashed, everything looking pristine. I wanted it to look as good as the other farmers down on BB Hill Road and on that road. And oh, farmers coming by, better clean some stuff up so things look a little nicer. How much of the time do we live for the appearance before men instead of saying, God, this is your property. Help me to do it all for you. Christian, do you pray through all your things that frustrate you and say, Lord, this is yours. And Lord, this is not about me. Are you willing to let go of the things that frustrate you so much? They only frustrate you because you value them probably too much. Just something to think about. Well, look on. We're not done for these verses. Could you look on with our next uh, verse, verse 17? Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, your, your holy place. Um, uh, here, shine, let your face uh, radiate with favor and goodwill is basically the idea of there to shine on your holy place, which is desolate. God, I just told you the things that are broken. Here, he's like, God, the temple's broken, but it's your place. It was your will. God, you're righteous. You, there's no wrong with you. So it's okay that it's been desolate, but would you shine your blessing upon it again? Basically, for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine. Here he comes before God, just seeking and desiring. Lord, this is your reputation. Verse 18, oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see your desolations. See our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you. You, because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Lord, I come before you totally on the basis of your compassion. I don't deserve this. I'm not entitled. Verse 19, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. God, it's all about you. Do you want to have a meaningful prayer life? Lord, it's all about you. Lord, I want more of my life to be totally wrapped up in you. I don't know who said this. It may have been Lehman Strauss. No man can have a true concept of himself until he draws near to God. Do you remember Isaiah in the year 
King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw the Lord. And what was his response? Woe is me. You cannot have a good understanding of yourself until you have a good concept of your God, until you adore him. Today, if it's been a long time since you've brought any sin before God, it isn't because you haven't sinned. It's because you're too insensitive about your sin. And it hasn't touched your life yet. My friend, you and I need to be confessing our sins daily. God, search me and know me. I'm so self-deceived because you told me so. Lord, help me to see my sins. That there be a little less of me and a whole lot more of you. The deeper your love for God, the higher your standard for holiness. The truer your connection to Christ and the greater your sense of sinfulness will be. I think, actually, I'm quoting this from Dr. David Jeremiah. Whenever you find yourself a stranger to confession, you are far removed from God. End of quote. Today, as we come to this, we want to be saying, Lord, help me to be jealous for your reputation. Help me to love you with all that I have. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for being such an amazing God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an example of a man who walked with you deeply, genuinely, who met with you on a regular basis, who prayed to you when it was illegal, as it was his custom since childhood. Lord, help us to have, be more accustomed to being with you than thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Lord, help us to meet with you so that there would be less of us and that the beauty of Christ would shine through us. Lord, help us to be compelled by the love of Christ. Help us to be shaped and moved and molded that there would be a little bit woe is me before you. Lord, help us to see you high and lifted up and that you would be high and lifted up in our prayers, that we would see all things as your possessions for your disposal, for your promotion, for your demotion. Lord, would you guide us to be submitted to you with complete contentment, not only in your sovereignty, that you are sovereign over all dominions throughout all times, but very much my life, Lord, you are the owner of. We love you, Lord, in Jesus we pray. Amen.